In the following video, I had the gain on my microphone turned up way too high, so prepare for distortion. My apologies. So, uh, how y'all doing? It? I'm doing good. I'm a detective. Yes. Yay! Oh, is Isaac a, a NASCAR fan now? <laughs> Isaac, Isaac likes all cars. So, yes. All right. He's he's not old enough to know better. <laughs> we'll get him into the good cars. <clears throat> all right. So, where were we? Oh, yes. Uh, right now, your only option is to go into the luxury skybox and face Benedict Kane. So, okay. Let me breathe and catch up to myself. You can't hear it, but I have noir music playing in the background. Okay. So. Good to know. Yes. All right. You walk into the luxury skybox with a confidence, with confidence and swagger of a brave hero who drinks bourbon. Benedict Kane is waiting for you, flanked by a pair of silent bodyguards. He has a hardened, hardened, loveless look of a man who is not to be trifled with. I've seen you, says Benedict Kane as he puffs his cigar. You've been snooping around, and I'm not sure I like that. Who are you, and what is it you want? Now you can say, never mind who I am, Mr. Kane, the photograph, yeah, and go straight for the photographs. You can say, I'm Stanton Stonemorrow, and go for the photographs. Or you can look at him and say nothing. I'm going to say nothing. All right. Ah, the strong, silent type, says Benedict Kane as he puffs smo a smoke ring that dances nonchalantly towards the ceiling. I can certainly respect a man who knows when to keep his mouth shut, but I think right now you better speak up and tell me who you are and what you're after. Now you can s continue to say, staring at him, saying nothing. You can say, never mind who he is, or you can say that you're Sam Stonemorrow, a private detective, etc. Your choice. It's basically the same choice as last time. Oh, yeah. I'll introduce myself this time. Now that I've earned some respect. Okay. Incidentally, if you had stayed silent, it would have led to my favorite ending of the game, but we're not here to die. I'm Sam Stonemorrow, the private detective, and I think you have some photographs that belong to my client, Vera Calypso. And I'm sure you haven't made copies, because no. that's not a thing. No, that's not a thing. That's not, you, you can't make, make copies. You can't make copies. That's not... You can't make copies of anything. Ever. Ever. Not even with pen and paper. Yeah, it's like Snapchat. Eventually they dissolve. Mm-hmm. Ah, so you're the private detective whose name is written on all those stray dogs around the city, says Kane. Well, Mr. Stone Morrow, I'm afraid I can't part with those pictures. I need them so I can blackmail Mrs. Calypso into sitting on my Komodo dragon egg. Now you can say, Kane, what's a wealthy guy like you need with a, some lizard? Or you, say, you can say that you don't want to resort to more insistent persuasion. I did not understand that last sentence. Ooh, sorry, it kind of ran away from me. Okay, you can ask him what he needs with a lizard, or you can tell him you're going to rough him up. Oh. Well, I want to know about the lizard. Okay. <clears throat> Listen, Kane, what's a wealthy guy like you need with some lizard anyway? It's a picture of a Komodo dragon. Very cool. I need that lizard to eat me, says B Benedict Kane. I have so much money, but wealth has brought me no joy. Only getting eaten by a lizard can make me happy. And so you see, I can't part with Vera's photographs, or she'll never sit in that lizard egg, and then the lizard will never hatch out of the egg and eat me. That's a touching story, Kane. But I'm also still going to need you to hand over those photographs. Otherwise, I might need to take them from you by force. Oh, he looks, looks, all right. 
you'll see it when it goes on YouTube, I guess. Is that so, Mr. Stone Morrow, says Kane, rising from his chair. He grins. I'm not sure my guards would be very happy with you if you did that. <laughs> I Sorry. I didn't know that uh, the man had a big gulp. <laughs> Just imagine it. Imagine him with a big gulp. The two men standing behind Kane look at you with grim eyes and crack their knuckles. They definitely look like they know a thing or two about breaking bones. One bodyguard is wearing an entire alligator skull around his neck <laughs> on a gold chain, and the other one is wearing a Mr. T shirt, that, or I'm sorry, a T shirt that says, My best friend Jeremy killed an alligator whose skull he's wearing around his neck with his bare hands, and I've killed an alligator too. Now, you can say, hang on a second, or you can reach into your gun pouch and pull, you out, pull, pull out your revolver gun pouch. God damn it. Gun pouch. That gun. is the one thing I will remember from all this. I keep my gun in my gun pouch. Oh, man. Um, I, I don't know what to do here. What do you think I should do? Can well, I ask you? <laughs> yeah, you know what? I, I'm kind of fuzzy on the details on this part. A friend. <laughs> because I get more enjoyment out of dying in this game than I do about when winning. <laughs> Which is weird, I know. But this, this game has some of the best deaths. <laughs> okay, I'll... I guess I'll go for my gun pouch. <laughs> He's going for his gun pouch! With a grim I'm look. Imagining a little coin purse with little crocheted guns <laughs> all over. That could, that could very well be. With a grim <laughs> look, you reach into your gun pouch and pull out your revolver. A gun! screams Benedict Kane. He turns to the guards. Guards, throw me to safety! Acting swiftly, each guard immediately grabs one of Kane's arms, and together they hurl him out the window. Mm -hmm. Goodbye, detective! He cackles as he flies out the window. He falls hundreds of feet to the hard pavement below. His body splatters on the ground like a shower of viscera. Stare and disbelief is your only option. Uh, I guess I'll stare. In disbelief. You can trade too. He's finding things. Into, say in disbelief. <laughs> I'll stare in disbelief. There we go. And that belief. The guards walk silently out of the room. You're left alone, pointing your revolver at nobody at all. With Kane dead, you'll never find out where those pictures are. You're out of clues, you're out of suspects, and you're out of time. You return to your office, defeated. The next day, the, f the front page of the newspaper has a picture of your parents getting matching tattoos of a heart with a word that says, My son did a bad job written inside of it. The headline reads, Parents of Worst Detective Gets Appropriate Tattoo. The End. Oh. Yeah. Fortunately, this has a checkpoint system, so we can just rewind. <laughs> okay. I can't believe you resorted to violence. To your gun pouch. <laughs> tisk, tisk. I didn't know what else to do. I panicked. Okay. Um, we're at the point where you can look at him and say nothing, or you can introduce himself. You want me to just kind of fast forward to the point where it's gun pouch or talk your way out? Sure. Okay. Uh, I don't want to come down there. Let's, uh, okay, what do you need with the lizard? Uh, that's a touching story. Okay, here we go. Now hold on a second, gentlemen, you say. Let's be reasonable. I'm sure we can negotiate an agreement we're all happy with. I'm afraid it's too late for reason, detective, says Kane. He snaps his fingers and his guards begin walking towards you. Jeremy and Vincent Sr. here will, are going to kill you now. Okay. My wife's looking at me. Now you can do, you can say one of two things. You can say, uh, you can ask them as a favor to rip you in half. Or you can say, before you kill me, let me smoke one last cigarette. Mm. It all comes back to the cigarettes. 
That's why one of the handful of them on his porch. I I gotcha. I gotcha. I just it's such a bad habit. Unless you're a detective. I don't feel like I don't feel like my character would smoke. I don't know. Okay, I will, well, I will smoke one last cigarette. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I will I will build like you know a a hippie granola eaten um, tea drinking gum chewing detective story f- just for you, Chuck. It's basically a fire assassin that raises a happy go lucky detective. I have a gun pouch and the cigarette pouch. <laughs> My cigarette pouch yet, is full of granola. Or better yet, he vapes. But he still drinks bourbon. All right. <laughs> now just wait a second, gentlemen. Before you kill me, will you at least let me smoke one last cigarette? The guards look e- at each other and shrug. Sure, why not? You'll be dead soon anyway, says Jeremy. You reach into your pocket and pull out a cigarette. With one motion so calm and unperturbed it borders on sleepwalking, you light up a cigarette. The beautiful, life-giving smog fills your lungs and stimulates your brain. Now your mind is clear, and you've developed a plan to get yourself out of this tight scrape. Hey, fellas, before you kill me, I just gotta know, is there any truth to the rumor going around that you two don't know any bird calls? (laughs) What did you say? screams Jeremy. He's so angry, he punches a hole in the wall. Who says we don't know any bird calls, shouts Vincent Sr. Rage turns his veins, the veins on his neck, into pulsating cobras of fury. Now you can say, oh, you know, it's just a rumor. Or you can say, relax, guys, it was just something I read on the cover of Muscular Bodyguard Quarterly. Your choice. I am polite. I'll go with the first choice. Oh, you know, it's just a rumor that's been going around. You touched it. It's a goddamn lie, shrieks Vincent Sr. Tears are streaming down his face. We know so (laughs) many bird calls. Relax, fellas. If you know so many bird calls, then why don't you just prove it and put away these nasty allegations to rest? Oh, we will, says Jeremy angrily. We'll do all the bird calls we know. The two guards start perfectly, perfectly excruciating and extremely long strings of different bird calls. Bird calls. Here's a sparrow, says Vincent Senior. Borse, 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 borse. Yeah, here's a pelican, says Jeremy. Croom, croom. And they go. They flawlessly imitate hundreds of birds from all regions around the world. Finally, they finish and they look at you with smug grins. Now. I love that the whole time this is going on, they're trying to have a play. <laughs> That's right, it's going on downstairs. <laughs> so the Hog Brothers are just <laughs> listening to all these screeching bird calls as they try to eat each other. Hark! My fellow brother, who I love too much, listen to the <laughs> sounds of the sparrow! Boris, Boris! <laughs> Boris, Boris! <laughs> Now you can say, way to go, fellas, I'm impressed. You can say, well, we can now put away those nasty rumors. Or you can give them a round of applause. Oh, well, that's the most disruptive thing I could do, so I've got to applaud. All right, you give them a round of applause. Suddenly, a growing thunder of distant wings flap the air, flaps fill the air. The floor starts to shake and the sounds of hundreds of thousand desperate beaks squawking in unison flood the room. Oh no! (laughs) Screams Jeremy. We did too many bird calls! Vincent (laughs) Senior moves towards you with murderous eyes. You little rat! You tricked us! He tries to grab you, but it's too late. The windows burst open and millions of different birds from all over the world fly into the room. The guards try fighting them off, but there are too many. Within seconds, the birds peck all the meat off their bone, and then one weird pelican <laughs> eats their bones. <laughs> the birds fly back out the window as quickly as they flew in, leaving you alone with Benedict Kane. <clears throat> Sorry, Kane. Looks like your muscles quit on you without giving their two weeks' notice. Now, 
Why don't you just hand over those photographs, you say? Okay. Okay. You win, detective. Just don't hurt me, says Benedict Kane. He reaches beneath his desk and pulls out a treasure chest. Wait, his desk? Uh, He's at a play. Yeah, and a skybox at a play. Although the treasure chest, that makes perfect sense in a play. <laughs> also, keep in mind, everybody is still watching The Magnificence that is the Hog Brothers. While <laughs> a herd of an insane flock of, of birds have just come in and pecked two, and eaten two bodyguards. So it's just, you know, but the desk, no, that's unreasonable. <laughs> the desk is where I draw the line. <laughs> he reaches beneath his desk and pulls out the treasure chest. Everything I stole from Vera is in this chest. Now you can say, glad you see things my way, I'll be seeing you. Or you can just grab the chest without a word and walk out. <clears throat> um, once again, gotta be polite. Oh, that's where we came in. Oh, that's where we came in, never mind. Oh, this drink business is really getting to me. All right. Glad you could see things my way, Kane. Maybe I'll see you around. Night has fallen outside the Grand Picador Theater. You stand in the lamplight with the treasure chest full of photographs. It feels heavier than you thought it would. But then, anything secret always seems to have extra weight to it. Hey, Sam says a familiar voice. You turn around. It's the dame. Chuck, you can either say, hey Vera, or you can say, hubba hubba. Your choice. Hey Vera. Hey Vera. <laughs> it's good to see you again. Do you have what I asked for? Now you can just give the chest to Vera, or you could say, it took me some doing, but yeah, I got it for you. Um, that one. The second one. The talky one. Yes. It took me a bit of doing, but yes, I got it for you, Vera. You hand the treasure chest to Vera. She opens it and checks its contents. Okay, she says. Everything I needed is then there. Thank you, Sam. You'll have your payment in the morning. You can walk away without looking back. You can thank her and keep an eye out for her. Or you can say, forget the payment. Well, once again, I don't work for free, so not option no three. To the okay. Um, I'll, I'll thank her. Thank you, Vera. I'll keep an eye out for it. We'll make your own choose your own adventure, and you can have a touch the butt option. <laughs> I don't know if you heard my wife, but she's talking to your wife and said, quote, I will make you your own choose your own adventure, and you will have a touch the butt option. Oh, no, I'm talking to zombie. Oh, I'm she's sorry. She's not talking to your wife. No. Good news. <laughs> Let me finish this up. The dame smiles. I'll see you around, Sam. She turns and walks away. And as soon as, <clears throat> and soon she's just a one of a dozen people on the streets carrying treasure chests <laughs> through the night. Wait, gun pouches and treasure chests. Okay. Noir is a weird world. You turn around and walk home. You make your way home through the dark city streets. One last time you pass the Grand Picador Theater. You cast a long shadow as you pass silently beneath the marquee lights. You return to your office, light up a cigarette and pour yourself a double of Cruel Boy's Bourbon, the most heroic drink in the world. The next day the headlines of the front page in the newspaper read, Competent Detective Solves Minor Problem. You did an okay <laughs> job. The city throws a very small parade in your honor, consisting entirely of two trumpet players who march three blocks without pant playing any music and then go to sleep on the sidewalk. <laughs> it's not bad work there, detective. <laughs> and sometimes, in this line of work, not bad is the best you can hope for. The end. Yay! I already made that in one sitting. I'm impressed. That took less than an hour. I am pleased. <laughs> Someday I will read you my favorite ending to all of this. But so that's a Sam Stone Morrow adventure. And uh, I, I guess we can do the next one later. 
obviously tonight I don't have the voice for it. Okay. What'd you think? That was good, man. That Thank was you good. Very much. I yeah. enjoyed that. I uh, I discovered it from uh, Super Great Friend. He he did a similar reading where he had people vote on their choices, but I can't do that. So I well, figured. I I figured this requires a Chuck in the room with me. Oh. I miss you too. I really miss you, man. Dude, I totally miss you. Oh. A uh, tooth in death's mouth. Yep. Sam Stone Marrow Mystery. And we just went through Death Attends the Matinee. As far as I know, there are only two Sam Stone Marrow Mysteries. And the author has written one other that isn't nearly as, as good as these. But, um... Yeah, th- these are good, man. As so if, if the Hog Brothers eat each other, what do they do for their second show? Or their third show? You, do you want me to read you the play? That would be really nice. I would enjoy that. Okay. Um, I need to start over and get there, but it shouldn't be hard to get there. So let me see. Uh, let's see. Uh, am I a detective? No. Up oh, my first ending. The dame immediately turns around and leaves. You sit back in your chair and look around your empty office. Even though nobody's there to see it, you give a thumbs up. The day passes without any incident, and 50 years later, you die of old age. All right. Anyway, let me try this again. Uh, Do you read the oatmeal? Uh, Occasionally. Uh, There was a comic he did that this just reminded me of. Where he said, there are two times when you are allowed to cry. The first is when your firstborn son is born. And the second is at the thumbs up scene at the end of Terminator 2. What did you just say? Okay. (laughs) The thumbs up reminded me of... Yeah. Good movie. Probably the best sequel of all time. All right. The Hogg brothers eat each other. A tragedy. Enter Gordon Hogg. He looks over the audience and speaks. Gordon Hogg. Here I am, Gordon Hogg, the eldest of the three Hogg brothers. I love my brothers too much. I just can't get enough of them. In fact, I only like doing three things. Looking at my brothers, thinking about my brothers, and dreaming that an insane doctor is sewing my brothers and me together. Keep watching the play. Of course. Gordon Hogg continued. Hark! I hear the approach of a man. By the sound of the footsteps, I can tell that it is my middle brother, Penance Hogg. You keep watching the play. Enter Penance Hogg. I'm sorry, Prentice Hogg. Prentice Hogg. Hello, my brother Gordon Hogg. I love you too much. Gordon Hogg. Hello, Prentice Hog, my brother. I was just thinking about you and dreaming of you at the same time. I love you too much. How are you today, Prentice Hog? I have a fatal, fatal and incurable case of brother fever. Other than that, I am extremely strong. I have just come out of a three-tiered bunk bed where I lay sleeping in the middle bunk, dreaming that my two brothers were taking turns picking me up and putting me down for 1,000 years. Gordon Hogg. Prentice Hogg, my brother. That dream about your brothers is so good. That dream is my king now. I hate God, and I love my brothers. Wait, what? (laughs) Prentice Hogg. I'm an atheist. Thank you for understanding that you are my brother named Gordon Hogg. (laughs) My love for my brothers is the only thing stronger than my hatred for God. Keep watching the play. Prentice wow. Hog. Hark! This went, <laughs> this went in a weird direction, and it was already called The Hog Brothers Eat Each Other. Hey, that'll be enough from the peanut gathering. Oh, oh god, I need another drink. The Hog Brothers also all carry big gulps. Uh, and gun pouches, where they keep their love for their brothers contained only slightly. Prentice Hog. Hark! I hear the sound of a man's leg doing a walk. 
From the sounds of the footsteps, I know that it is the youngest brother of the Hog Brothers, our beloved brother named Whipple Hog. Keep watching. Yeah, Enter. Let's, let's see it through to the end. Yeah, oh yeah. Enter Wimple Hog. Wimple Hog. Hello, my two brothers. I love you too much. Your names are Gordon Hog and Prentice Hog. I wish I could kill God. What? Prentice Hog. What the heck? Hello, Wimple oh. Brother. <laughs> Hello, Whipple Hog, my brother. When it comes to dreaming about you, I am the world's champ. I love you too much. Gordon Hog, our mother gave birth to us at the same time, but we are not triplets. <laughs> Keep watching. You're welcome. You're welcome. Prentice Hog. Whipple Hog, my brother, my how are you feeling? Whipple Hog, my brother. <laughs> My brother Fever threatens to claim my life at any moment. Other than that, I am endlessly powerful. I have just come from our three-tiered bunk bed, where I lay sleeping on the bottom bunk, dreaming that I was getting a haircut from both of my brothers at the same time. Gordon Hogg, Wimple Hogg, you are my brother. That dream is magnificent. When you, when your brothers were finished cutting your hair, what did you do with the hair? Whipple hog. I dumped the hair on the floor of room 242 of the San Torino Hotel. I'm sorry, that's ter Terry Row. Ter Terry Row Hotel. My bad. Prentice hog. If I were a, if I wish a magician would rip God in half. Keep watching. What? What? <laughs> All three just, brothers in unison. These have been the nice brothers haunted dreams of glorious hog brothers. May we never die, for if we do, we will surely go to heaven, the house of God, the monster. We love each other too much, and now we will go eat each other. Amen. The hog brothers exit. The sounds of tearing flesh, snapping bones, and three mouths chewing are heard from off stage. The actors take a bow. The Hog Brothers eat each other has come to an end. The audience is on its feet, and the play is receiving a well-deserved standing ovation. Wow. I know, it's magnificent, isn't it? The acting. The acting. That is the last I... Yeah. I'm speechless. I, I am without speech. Oh man. And I've experienced the Hog Brothers run over a benevolent king. It's great. <laughs> uh, I just don't understand modern art. Yeah. What's to understand? <laughs> Alright. Well, with that, I think I'm going to call this video quits. <laughs> okay. And, uh, yeah. Um,. Thank you for YouTube's watching, and thank you to Cinema's Tom Cruise for enjoying this wonderful rendition of Death Attends the Matinee. Say goodnight, Chuck. Goodnight, Chuck.